All right, did you um, get something out of last sermon? We were talking about the truth. I'm in the middle, If in case you're joining us today for the first time. Uh, the sermon series that I uh, started last week is called Suit Up Church. Suit Up Church. Do we have the, the sermon graph up there? There you go. It's the armor of God. We are, we are going through the armor of God. And uh, because we're living in a, a time and in an age where it kind of feels like we have to get ready. We have, this is not a call to war or to warfare, but this is simply a a call to get ready. When the Apostle Paul wrote this to the church in in Ephesus, or or to that entire region, he wrote it to all the Christians to be prepared in their lifetime about what's coming their way, what's all about them. They had the the temple worship to the Artemis, one of the great goddess of the the ancient culture here. And so there there was a riot going on. There was all sorts of crazy stuff stuff going on back then, and in the midst of all that, the Apostle Paul reminded the church, we got to suit up. We, we need to suit up. We need to wear the full armor of God, and that's really important. <coughs> you have to excuse me still. <coughs> I'm still getting over that. You can probably hear I have a little stuffy nose here. Um, let's uh, go back into Ephesians chapter 6, and this is the full armor of God. I'm going to read all the elements. Somebody said yesterday, is like, oh, we only talked about one element. I would have liked to hear all the elements, so let's, let's just read through it really quick. Uh, sorry for neglecting that. But again, the whole thing is about stand, that we have to be strong. It talks about finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might, because the strength in which we need to stand is not ours, right? It is It is God's, and we get to put on His strength. Isn't that cool? We can be the weakest Christian, but He is strong. All we have to do is to put on this this coat, this this mantle of God's strength. We can clothe ourselves with God's strength. That's really cool. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Again, the devil is not attacking directly, but he is always this mischievous thing. He has his ways to sneak in and to pull strings and to manipulate, to twist truth. Um, He's just, (laughs) he has done this for uh, much longer than we're alive, so he's an expert in this, and we have to be aware of that and to prepare, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness. The present is not present light, it is present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. Don't leave anything out. If you go through the armory, did you ever see a war movie? And right before the battle starts, they all go to, to the chamber where they hand out the weapons. Did you ever see one of them that says, no, I don't need that. No, I'm going to skip that. You know, um, yeah, that looks good to me. I'm just like, you, you're not taking this battle serious, right? It tells you that that person does not take what's coming serious. Because normally it's like, can I have this too? And can I have that too? I think I need a little extra of that. Let's put on two plates of righteousness on me, you know. That should be our attitude. And when it comes to the spiritual things, even more so, because we live in the flesh. Everything that we see is in the flesh, right? But we know that the world that is, that is pulling on us, that is trying to come in to steal, kill, and destroy, th- those worlds are real. And sometimes it catches us completely off guard. We don't even know where those attacks are coming from, but they're real, and we have to be ready for it. So we need the full armor of God that you may be able to withstand. Again, a second time it talks about standing. It's all about standing, not marching forward, not walking back, not, not taking taking steps back, not walking to the side or sitting down. The, the call is so interesting is to stand. In the presence of evil, stand. Because there's too many people that bow down in the presence of evil. There's too many people that take a step back in the presence of evil. Or that try a little shortcut or the compromise. So the call is always to stand and to stand firm, to withstand in the days of evil, having done all to stand firm, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. We talked about this last time. Um, let me just go through it, having, otherwise I skip it again. Uh, the belt of truth and having put on the, uh, the breastplate of righteousness. And the shoes on your feet, having put on uh, the readiness uh, given by the gospel of peace in all circumstances. 
I love this. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith uh, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the, of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplications. It's like we got to stand, we've got to pray. And praying is how we stand, right? Amen. Prayer is so important. If we do not have a regular prayer life, we are not standing. Now, sometimes we have problems. Even if we have marriage problems, if we don't pray together, conflict comes. Now, one of the number one things that I, that I advise in any kind of marriage counseling is not techniques about you need to have a listening ear and you need to have a speaking ear and there's time for this and there's time. It's like, oh, yeah, it's all, it all has its place. But guys, do you pray together? <laughs> Because if you pray in the Spirit, it unites hearts together. Because you look at somebody else who is bigger than you are. You look outside of your present circumstances about all the problems that you have. So praying is utterly important. Now, in all of this, there are six elements. And it's interesting because in our structured mind, we, we naturally think, well, it starts with top to bottom, right? So the first element will be the helmet of salvation. The last element is going to be the shoes, readiness of the gospel, right? But it is not the case. When the Apostle Paul writes that he, he literally observes people like getting up in the morning and just girding themselves like the Roman soldiers, how they do it. Like Apostle Paul wakes up and he sit, just sits there and watches his guard as he gets dressed. Must be uncomfortable for the guard, but he's just watching him, you know, and he puts on the belt and it puts on the breastplate, puts on the helmet, puts on the shoes, and uh, we're gonna go over the sequence again here. But the first element is the belt, because we talked about it last week. The belt is such a crucial foundational piece. Without truth, everything else falls apart. If you're not honest to yourself, <laughs> There is no correcting other people. There is, it, it, you cannot preach the gospel. The enemy will come in uh, when we, back in Nepal, we cast out a demon once. And my, my friend from South Africa, Herr Drutz uh, was his name. And he cast out a demon of somebody. And this, this, the, the, the demon out of this guy just started speaking out. was like, uh, it's like, what about your sins? And he started naming uh, sins in, in Herdrutz's life, like <laughs> what he has done wrong. It's like he knows everything. It's like he knows everything that he has ever committed. And then we, but we took authority in Her, Herdrutz. Uh, he just said, like, this is not of your business. I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. You know, the enemy knows the truth. He knows all of our weakness. He knows the truth. If we live in denial... <laughs> We have a big target on our back because he knows the truth and he can always come in and attack us with the truth of our own failure. And if we're, if we're too prideful, if, if we don't want to uh, see the truth for what it is, then we will always feel ashamed and naked and embarrassed somehow. The enemy will always have an easy uh, game with us to sh somehow shame us and embarrass us. And so we, have, we need to be girded with the belt of truth. And I hope this last week you really just took some time and just to talk about that, like, well, where is the truth in my life? Do I live in the truth? But now today I want to go to the second piece, and that is the breastplate of righteousness. And says, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness. That's a strange concept, right? How often do we hear today in our society a talk about righteousness? I mean, we talk about truth, right? When we deal with the children, we talk about truth. Come on, say the truth. What is the truth? We talk about the gospel and being ready, you know, in season and out of season. We talk about faith a lot. You just need to have faith. We talk about the Word of God. We talk about all salvation. We talk about all other elements, but I'm telling you, the breastplate of right and righteousness as a concept in itself is the least talked about element of the armor of God. It belongs, if we go into the armory, it belongs to it. It's like coming to the armory, it's like, righteousness? What, 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 what is that? Like, I'm, I'm not even sure if I need that. Righteousness is the most overlooked or most misunderstood 
element of the armor of God, and yet it is so absolutely crucial. And once I, I dove into the sermon, I, I really saw that, and the Lord just really put that strong on my heart. So let's talk about this old concept of righteousness. Because really, only the only place where you find righteousness is not uh, written anywhere today in our law books. The only place where this is written is in the Bible. It is a concept that comes from the Bible. We find it nowhere else, in no contract, in no work agreement, uh, work contract. Nowhere ever does it ever, anywhere talk about righteousness except in God's book. And for some reason... The word righteousness, diakonu, uh, um, um, I forgot the, the, the Greek ending, uh, diakon, uh, usi or something, <laughs> anyway, forgive me for that. But that concept appears in the Bible a lot. It's like, why does it come up so often here? Nowhere else in our secular society does the concept ever come up. And where is that gap in between, between what is the concept of righteousness? Dikaiosune, now I know it. <laughs> um, and where, where we are at, where we live our present life today. It's such a, a strange thing. And for that, I want to take us all the way to Romans chapter 1. Because that's really where the concept of righteousness, where the rubber hits the road. Because that is, it, it talks about here in, in the first chapter, in verse 16, it talks about the, the I, I don't know if you have a different heading in your Bible. In my Bible, it says, the righteous shall live by faith. And right then in verse 18, I have a different heading that says, God's wrath on unrighteousness. So there's something about righteousness, and there's something about unrighteousness. Let's get in it really quick. It says, the righteous shall live by faith. Verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation. So, okay, we, we get that part. It's the gospel, and we're not ashamed of the gospel. It's God's power through which he saves people. To everyone who believes, to the Jews first and also to the Greeks. For it, in it, in it, it talks about the right, it talks about the Bible, the gospel, right? In it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. Now, who is, you know, what is a gospel message about? It's about the Lord Jesus Christ, right? It is that Jesus saves, it, it, that the, he, he died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. Our gospel message is that in that, God reconciles the world to himself. The Lord Jesus died on the cross. It, we are not emptying the cross of its power. This is the salvation. This is the gospel message. And in this, the righteousness of God is revealed. That's an interesting concept. In this, in this death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, purchase, purchasing us, uh, uh, loosening us from sin and paying off that ransom, he, he, all that atonement work that's going on here, in all of this, the righteousness of God is revealed, which basically means it's plain to everybody. Everybody can see it. So it's this concept about us living a life and not knowing what is right and wrong and just falling into sin, living our, our own lives in sin, in our own ways. We just want to live to ourselves, for ourselves, uh, for a future to ourselves, instead of just, and disregarding everything that God has. But in the cross, in the submission, in taking a knee at the cross, and like, Lord, I cannot fix my life. I cannot do the future I, I don't know any, it's like, and there's no strength in me whatsoever in this humbling ourselves to God and saying, Lord, I need your strength, I need your forgiveness, I need your salvation, please come into my life and restore this life. In that, the righteousness of God is revealed because the, the, the righteousness is like being right and doing right versus being wrong and doing wrong. It's like who is right and who is wrong. It's like the righteousness of God. In that, the righteousness is re revealed. The Holy Spirit has come into the world to convict the world of its sin. He is teaching us what is right and what is wrong. 
and he's teaching us to repentance. God's righteousness is revealed in this act of salvation. Let's go further when it talks about unrighteousness. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of man, and by their, uh, who by their unrighteous suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, his divine nature, have been clearly perceived even since the creation of the world. Every, God's existence, like if we just look at the flower or a bird that, that sings out there, we, we see the perfection in which God has created everything and it, it is, shows, it gives evidence that he exists in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or gave thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God, and now here is, here is what God is doing. It's not, God is not standing there. And he takes this huge sledgehammer and like whack-a-mole just, just, just hits them over the head, right? Because they have been sinning. But look, look how God is reacting when the world is rejecting God. When they think that they're wise in their own eyes, and God knows that he is right. The righteousness is with God. It's revealed. It is with God. But if the world wants to do their own stuff, here's how God reacts. And we find this three times in, here in verse 24, 26, and 28. It says here, Therefore God gave them up. God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts and impurity and dishonoring their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worship and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And then 26, for this reason, God gave them up to this honorable passion for their women exchanged natural relationships uh, for those that are contrary to nature. And men likewise gave up the natural relationships with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see it fit to acknowledge God, God at third time, gave them up to the debased mind to the debased mind and to do what ought not to be done isn't that interesting what god's reaction is if we just want to go our own way god is not like a whack-a-mole just walk, whacking us over the head but god is literally taking a step back god is literally taking a step back as he gave them up it's like all right i need to if you have a child that constantly wants to, to touch the, the, the burner on the stove and it just doesn't get it, it doesn't get it that the flame is hot, that the flame is hot, it's almost like, okay, once you allow the child to just get burned, and then once it gets burned, it learns for life that that thing is off, that is off limit. Like, you, you're not touching that thing, right? God is not a cruel God, who, and, and sometimes... Uh, we hear that, that you know, b because we are believers and uh, people that don't believe, they're like, no, you, God has so many rules. You cannot do this. You cannot get drunk. You cannot have sex with everybody. You know, there's just so many limitations and so many rules. Like, God has the best thing in store for us and he has the best thing in mind for us. Don't you think God does that because he wants to protect us? Because if we want to have our own stuff, if we always want to do our own thing, you know, all that God can do is like taking a step back. It's like, all right, let's see how far you get. And we all know we don't get very far. We all know that there comes a time where we just fall flat on our face and we're like, all right, we are in need of a Savior. I think Rudolf Bultmann, uh, one of the people that was actually... Uh, very controversial in, in his time, but he tried to save um, the gospel from being completely sold out by liberal theology, and he always said, we are, we, are, we are standing in the presence of the Word of God that speaks to us, and it's all about how we respond to it. And even in this life, we are limited in this life um, by death so that we have an eternal reminder that 
that we are not Lord over our own lives, but that we are in need of a Lord. And that is the reason why suffering exists and why God sometimes allows suffering in our life as a reminder, not just at the end of our life, but in every day that we are limited, that we are limited and then that we are in the need of a Savior, that we are not Lord over our own lives, but that we need a Lord for our lives. And I think that he expressed that really well. We cannot save ourselves in that salvation, in this humbling act to come to God. We, we experience the righteousness of God that we are not right. We, if we are left to ourselves, man, we are going down. <laughs> we, we are falling flat on our face. We, we are messing up our own life. But that's not what God wanted for us. Uh, let's look at um, chapter 3, verse 10. Uh, it says here, no one is right. Uh, verse 10 and 11, chapter 3, Romans chapter 3, verse 10 and 11. No one is righteous. It's not like anybody is born ever righteous, right? A, a child, a baby, when a baby is born, it is innocent, right? A baby is born innocent, but nobody is naturally born righteous, because righteousness comes from God. Righteousness comes from God. It is as we're getting baptized, we're dying to our old life. We are dead to our old life, to our trespasses, to our sins and everything. We don't want our own life, which means we don't want our own way. But we want to live for Jesus for the rest of our life, who is the revealed righteousness in our life. And we want to be a part. We can take on the righteous. We're not born righteous. No one is righteous. Not one, no one, there is no one that understands and no one who seeks God naturally out of themselves. Verse 21, further down it says, but now the righteousness of God has been made manifest apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. We have God's righteousness revealed to us, and it's very clear. But let's, there's one more co uh, concept. For this, I, I brought a sermon prep here just to illustrate that. In Isaiah chapter 28, in verse 17, there, God talks about his righteousness in a very particular way. He talks about it, and he says, And I will make justice a line, and righteousness a plumb line. I will make righteousness a plumb line. Honey, can you give me my plumb line? Okay, here is a funny thing. When I, I'm in, in the middle of building a deck, do you know what this is? That's a plumb line, right? I'm in the middle of building my deck out there, and it's a do-it-yourself deck. So <laughs> we'll see how it looks like. And when I, I went to Menards and, and I bought this thing, and Jenna made fun of me. I was like, well, you're going to build this deck like the Egyptians built the, the pyramids? And I'm like, yeah, you laugh, but this thing is going to come in handy. I know it. You know, the funny thing is I used this thing more than a level. I really did. Because anywhere where I measure on this whole thing, I can be off. Uh, my, my deck stands on, on two, on a slope, oops, on a slope that slopes down in two directions. And it's really hard. I'm, I'm trying to level something out and put something straight, and I put the level on, and you can be off, but if you're off just a little bit, and it, it makes a huge difference, and all of a sudden a board doesn't fit in them, where they're like, where did I mess up? It's because you compromise with just that one little millimeter even, you know, in, in, in my metric system. And so this plumb line has come in extremely uh, handy already. Um, so I have proved my wife wrong. <laughs> just have to say that. But I, I want to I show you something with that because the Lord compares His righteousness to a plumb line. Now, we know what a plumb line is for, right? What's the plumb line for? Make sure something is absolutely straight. So instead of just uh, relying on, <coughs> on a level, <coughs> believe it or not, I have two levels 
and both show me different things, <laughs> it's because I bought cheap. And if you know, <laughs> if you buy cheap, you buy twice, right? <laughs> or even three times. And so I've learned that lesson many times. It seems like I never really learned it anyway. But <clears throat> even when the, the bubble level is not 100% straight, and when it's somehow off, the, just the way that it was constructed, this thing is always straight because it's not determined on my craftsmanship, but because of gravity. It's something that God created, right? God created something that, that makes this plumb line absolute, and I'm trying to get this like really, really steady to be absolutely calm. And so what God says, when we talk about the breastplate of righteousness, we ought to put on the righteousness of God. We know that in salvation, we have the righteousness of God revealed to us. It's, it's all there. And then he comes up with something funny, and he says, my, I will make my righteousness the plumb line. You ever think about that? I will make my righteousness like this. A straight line that does not move. You can't compromise with it. You know, and the, the funny thing is with, with this plumb line, one of the things that I discovered with this plumb line is, believe it or not, but it's actually offensive. It bugs me. <laughs> it's like, can't you just, like, there, there's a couple things where I constructed and the plumb line revealed the truth to me, like, no, you're off. And I'm like, man, I, I wish I can't just, just push it a little bit, <laughs> just like, just earth rotation, just, just move it a little bit and then it's all good. I don't have to do this thing all over again. Or, you know, we, we go in our life and, and we're like, this is too, too calm. This is too straight. You know, can, can this thing just swing like a pendulum, just compromise a little bit? And, you know, may, maybe there's some truth to this. And, you know, maybe I can add yoga to my spiritual food and I can do this and I can do, you know, it's like it doesn't all have to be straight. But when God says, no, this is not it, my truth, what I have revealed in creation and in salvation, in my son, Jesus Christ, that I have allowed to die for you, it is absolutely straight. There is no discussion about it. There is no compromise about it. There is no bickering with it or being offended at it. You got to accept it. You got to accept it. You got to take a knee. You got to bow to it. I'm like there is one righteousness. It is revealed by God. It's not what I think is right. What I think is wrong. I mean, everybody is subject to their own opinion, right? We can have a lot of opinions, but the opinion of God is a straight line. It is as straight as it gets. And no amount of discussion about it or persuasion is ever going to change that. This thing is going to be straight. And the thing is, the, what I know, I tried this out at home. It was like, as I went over the sermons, like, how am I going to do this? And so I set this up, and then I noticed how calm this thing is. And really, literally, the first impression that I felt when in a life where everything is in flux, everything is in motion, everything is up to discussion and to, to this, is like, this is offensive. This is the cause and the offense. There is a reason why Jesus Christ is called the stumbling block over everybody, uh, that everybody has to stumble. Jesus Christ is the stumbling block and the power of the cross. We cannot empty the power of the cross. The cross is offensive. Who wants to die? Who wants to pick up their own cross and follow Jesus? Like, die to yourself? Like, I want to get baptized. I want to put that picture on Instagram, but dying to my old life? Wait a second. A, you know, it's like, it's offensive. Like, following God and following the truth of God, following the salvation of God, and what God says is right. In Romans 1, we read so many things about where God's like, I, I am God. I am saying what is right, and you don't like it, and you want to walk your own way, so I have to take a step back, and let, let's see how far you get. Because you want to make this thing, you, you uh, pendulum, and compromising, and twisting, and everything, and to encompass for your wishes, and desires, and, and lusts, and everything. And as you do that, you wait and see how that construction thing is, is going to look like in the end. It's going to be all crooked, and probably even collapse. But if you use the plumb line, the righteousness of God that has been revealed 2,000 years ago for everyone to see, if we 
to make sure it doesn't crash down here. If we used the Bible, the Word of God as the righteousness of God, this is the righteousness. When the Apostle Paul says, put on the breastplate of righteousness, he talks about don't just do your own things. Don't just think that you are right. There is a book that is written about what is right and what is wrong. And you can be offended at this book all day long. And you can slander about it. You can meet with your neighbor and have a gossip talk about how offensive this book is because that stuff is written in there. And we need to change up the Bible. You can do whatever you want. In the end of the day, this truth still holds. And the righteousness of God is still revealed. And all we can do is to submit to it and to accept it into our life. Now, when the Apostle Paul talks about it, that the righteousness, we have to put that on. Just like in the armory, we have to put on God's, that God is right. You know what the difference is between the righteousness of God and ours? Ours is self-righteousness. <laughs> it's self-righteous. You know, and if everybody walks around being self-righteous, it's like you have a plethora of opinions. And people can bash in their heads over their plethora of opinions. It's kind of like, feels like we have some of that stuff going on already. But there's, you know, self-righteousness does not lead to salvation. It only uh, causes division and pulls people apart. But there is a plumb line. There is the straightness of the truth of God where he says, if you harbor resentment, you forgive. If you are living in sin, you ask for forgiveness. You know, they, they, those, those are plumb line straight things. And we, we, we offer you sacrifice at the altar. You can worship me whatever you want. Man, if you have something in your heart against somebody, leave that and go first and apologize. Make things right. Make things straight. Otherwise, you just come, uh, out of, otherwise, it's just dead religion. So we have to take on with this second element the righteousness of God. That's not our righteousness. We're not born righteous. It's not our opinionation. It is what God says is right and what God says is wrong, yep. that that is wrong. You know, and taking that on, that fortifies us for everything that's out there, for everything that the enemy is throwing at us, for every uh, division when, when he comes to try to kill, steal, to, to destroy in our life. If we make the plumb line of God and the righteousness of God, you know, when somebody, when the enemy then comes and accuses us of something, we can say, yeah, you're right. <laughs> but it was washed away in the blood of Jesus Christ. And then at that name, every knee must bow in heaven, on earth, and you too, right? Like every, every knee must bow. That is the righteousness of God that has been revealed. And we can walk as the children of God. We can walk in that righteousness. We can take the, but we have to make sure it is the righteousness of God and not the self-righteousness, and that's a fine distinction. How, how, do we get, how do we protect ourselves from not having self-righteous opinion, but instead of what God's righteousness is? Well, that's by the way of feeding ourselves. Amen? If we spend time with God, we will know the heart of God. Prayer. If we read the Word of God, we will know His thoughts toward us. Even if I read in Leviticus all the laws and everything, I still feel how God is talking to me. I still feel like even when I talk about ceremonial laws and like, well, we don't have animal sacrifice anymore, but I feel there's something about this holy God, that he, he is a holy God and He cannot accept sin in His presence. It still impacts me. Even if I read a genealogy where I, I, I see that a Oh, a, a prostitute is in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Even if it's boring reading through the genealogy, but I feel like that, man, God's faithfulness extends through generations. It speaks to us. And that is, if we feed ourselves with the word of God, then that righteousness, that, that imparts on us. If we have a relationship with the righteous God, show me your friends and they'll show you who you are, right? If we have God as our friend, we become like him. I, I, I am so fascinated by how Abraham and Moses in Scripture are, are called friends of God, that walk with God, and God, where God even says, can I withhold anything from Abraham? 
And it's like I share my thoughts openly with them. You know, that relationship. When we can have a relationship with God, the more time we spend with God, the more we're going to walk with Him or fill a house with worship music and we read the Word, the more this righteousness of God becomes a part of us too. His Spirit becomes alive inside of us. And then when we watch a, a bad movie, this Holy Spirit inside of us goes like, can you switch that channel? Can you switch that off? And then we have to listen to that because God's righteousness about what is right and what is wrong is bearing witness inside of us through the conscience. And we cannot violate that. Like, no, wait a second, let's just swing this a little bit. You know, it's, it's going to be all right. That, that's not it. That's not it. The, it's a it's, it's straight line. It's offensive, but yet this is where the fulfillment of life is. This is where the calling of God is. This is where the purpose, the blessings, and everything of God lies. Amen? Yeah. Amen. So this week, as, as we are going through this next week, I really want you to think about what is this concept about the righteousness of God in my life. It's true. You will not find this word anywhere in, in secular society, only in Scripture. It is revealed only in Scripture, in salvation, in Jesus Christ. Where is that righteousness of God? And am I going in my life like this sometimes? Or is this straight? And if I hold this plumb line against my own life, is there something that's off? Where I just want to do my own stuff or where I harbor secrets or something? Or do I, do I take God's righteousness? We cannot, you know, the breastplate of righteousness is also for, uh, protecting us against the fiery darts of the enemy. Not just the shield of faith. The shield of faith helps us so that it doesn't even get to us, right? But even if we lower our shield, sometimes if we don't have faith, we are still protected because God's righteousness. God's righteousness protects us. It is a part of the armor. It is not an offensive thing. It is a defensive thing that protects us from the attacks of the enemy. Because if we're like this, we leave so many open doors for the enemy to come in, to steal from us, to kill from us, to destroy from us, to compromise and to drag us down somewhere where we never wanted to go. And that's why he says, no, make this straight. Don't, don't, don't waver, don't, don't compromise. It's a straight line. Take, take that straightness of God on and clothe yourself with that, it will suit you well for everything else that's coming that you're going to face during the day at the workplace, at school, college, wherever. Amen? Man, let's stand up. If I have altar team here, prayers, would you guys just come to the front? just want to offer prayer again. If, if you want to stay a couple minutes longer, just stay here for prayer. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your righteousness. It's a concept that we truly don't find in this world very often. We talk a lot about opinions. <laughs> Just have to look to an election and, and see all the opinions that are out there. Every news channel has different opinions. But you have revealed your righteousness. You have revealed what is right and what is sin. You have revealed it in your son, Jesus Christ, when you sacrificed him on our behalf. And you are urging us to take on your righteousness. It's not something we're born with, but it is something that you have provided for us. And we can take that on. Lord, I just ask for this week, would you just bless Riverside? Would you visit us with divine visitation in our thoughts and in our hearts? at our workplaces, when we wash dishes, when we're under a car and just fixing our car, would you reveal your righteousness to us? Would you hold up this straight plumb line against our life? We want to invite you and welcome you. Hold up this straight plumb line against our own life and show us, reveal to us where we're off. And we know that you don't want to do that because you want to punish us, but you want to protect us in evil days. And we ask, Father, for this. Help us, protect us, reveal those things to us. We are your children, and we want to live for you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you very soon. Stay for prayer.